let's get started. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. I think we've had um, very, very close to 300 registrations. So if you've got some last minute friends or family that you can uh, send the link to, then um, we'll, we'll have about 300 people engaged in this conversation. So look, I'm really pleased uh, to have the guys, James and Nick from American Airlines along today. I'll let them introduce themselves. Our plan for this session is to make it conversational and try to involve yourselves on the line in it as much as possible. So look, it won't be a, we're gonna present for 30 minutes and then we're gonna take Q and A. We're gonna have it as a discussion and we're going to try to um, answer the questions that are gonna be most helpful for, uh, for you in your understanding and, and your own programs around safety too in practice while at the same time letting the guys tell you their story and the things that they've done over the last couple of years. So if you're familiar with Zoom, which I'm sure everyone is by now, we've got a Q&A function um, as well as a chat. You can pile into the chat and, um, and chat amongst yourselves and let people know where you're from and where you're joining from. But if you've got a question that you'd like us to uh, bring into the conversation, then please use the, use the Q&A function and we'll try to get through as many of those as we can. So without going uh, any further, I'd really like to just hand over to James and Nick to, to introduce themselves and then we'll... Uh, um, we'll get, get on with it. Thanks, David, and uh, thanks everyone around the world from uh, James Kwasney and uh, Allied Pilots Association and American Airlines. Thanks for having us today. We're, we're super excited to be here today. We've uh, been working with you for years now. We, we love the work that you guys do at Forge Works, and we're really, we're, we're really excited and honored to be part of your part of your podcast today. So, uh, like Dave said, please uh, interrupt, uh, shoot questions at us. Uh, this is your time as much as ours. Um, we've been doing a lot of presenting the last few months, and and uh, hopefully a few people have even seen some of our presentations. We want this to be able to answer the questions you all have. Um, I can pull up supporting material if we need it, but primarily I want this to be your time. So so please give us questions, and and we'll we'll do our best. Um, but I would like to introduce myself, and Nick will do that for himself. Uh, James Quasney, I fly the 737 here in Dallas, Fort Worth as, as a captain. Um, but an interesting role I have is I'm primarily the um, union representative, our pilot union representative to the process. In all of our safety programs at American Airlines, uh, we have generally have the, the union representation has a, has a seat with the company and we work hand in hand to make sure that we're, we're working towards the same objectives and that we're all on the same sheet of music. So I'm actually the union representative. Uh, I've been doing safety for almost 10 years at American and, and longer than that um, from my background in, in, in the US Air Force, um, but 10 years with proactive safety with LOSA initially and now into safety two. We call our safety two program at American Airlines LIT, uh, L-I-T. It stands for Learning Improvement Team. Um, we wanted to make a big point that we we want to emphasize the word learn. It's all about learning for us. And, and that's what we want to work on and improve at American is learning. Uh, and a lot, a lot of that's our push. So just a quick history of how we started. Uh, our senior leadership was at the Flight Safety Foundation Conference back in 2017 that Eric presented at. And Eric presented um, uh, some of his safety two general ideas to them. And our, our senior safety leadership loved it they brought it back and they brought it back to my um, counterpart at the company and asked us to look into it we were running the losa program at the time and losa for those of you that don't know is line operations safety audit it's a, a self-auditing program where we go out and fly around on our own cockpit jump seats and record data uh, and we do that according to threat and error management as the taxonomy we use there we've been running that for years uh, and we still run that program but they asked us to look into it and see if we would like to look at the safety too um, we read all the books we could find. We watched podcasts and videos of Sydney and, and Eric and David Woods and David Provan and Ron Gann. And we watched them all and we tried to learn. And then we made a quick stab at what we thought might be an effort at Safety 2. Uh, and we reached out to Eric in Copenhagen. And we asked his opinion and we asked him if he might have some time to spend with us. And he invited us to come out to Copenhagen. And we spent a day with him back in early 2018. And he was very gracious with his time and his expertise and taught us a lot more in probably one day than we learned in a, in a lot of the other reading uh, and gave us some vectors to go and he, he recommended we go and create our own language, create our language from scratch, um, which sounded like a big, a big effort. And it was actually a significantly bigger effort than we even knew at that time. But we have finished that, that journey, we think. Uh, and, and we'll share a little bit of that today. If you would like, I can get into that. Um, but we, our white paper does discuss that. 
Um, so uh, we came back from that discussion with Eric and we formed a team and we decided we were gonna create an aviation based uh, safety to language to work in our domain. And we've been doing that for the last couple of years. And I wanna hand it off to my, uh, my, my right hand man on the, pro the project is uh, Nick Peterson. And we'll let Nick um, talk to us about his, uh, his experience and where he comes from and, and his role in the process. Nick? Thanks James. Uh, thank you David, thanks to everyone around the world. Uh, very, very happy to be here, very excited. Uh, my name is Nick Peterson. Currently I'm in transition. Uh, I was flying the Airbus uh, 320 family, but I'm transitioning to the 777. So going from domestic uh, short haul to international long haul. I first uh, became involved in safety uh, during the US Airways American Airlines merger where we were combining uh, the flight operations of those two companies into one. And uh, that's a very difficult time for the airline because the, they operated the airplanes a little bit differently and our, our pilots had to go through numerous changes in a short amount of time. So I was part of a group that would uh, kind of educate the pilots on those changes, answer questions, and then we would actually go observe flights to see how the, the changes were going. Uh, after that, I joined the American Airlines LOSA program in 2016 uh, as an observer. And in 2019, I was asked to become part of LIT, the Learning Improvement Team. Uh, at that time, we were very early on in our journey. There were only two other members, and uh, we were basically trying to figure out uh, what we were what we were going to do. And so our initial... Um, our concepts were just creative uh, brainstorming and, and uh, the first uh, attempt at the first stab, I should say, is uh, we picked uh, some targeted crews, some pilots that, that were known by reputation to be high functioning. And we went out and rode around with them on flights, live flights, uh, trying to witness or record or observe resilient uh, performance. Um, quickly, we stepped away from targeting the crews and, and moved to what we do in the LOSA world, which is just completely random, uh, where you just walk up and select uh, uh, any particular crew they don't know ahead of time that you're uh, coming, uh, because we figured that probably would give us the best insight as to what's really going on, uh, uh, because anytime a, a flight crew shows up to go to work, they don't know how that day goes, and so the random aspect we thought would be more interesting for uh, the data collection. Um, currently, we have two methods of data collection. The first are the flight observations that I talked about, where an observer will go out and ride on the flight deck uh, with the crew, recording uh, and observing the resilient performance. And the other uh, we call shop talk, which is a one-on-one, -on -one basically discussion we, uh, where we sit down with line pilots, usually in training, and talk to them about uh, some various questions and various things that we want to know about. It kind of started uh, as a proof of concept from the learning teams, uh, trying to figure out a way to gather information from our frontline pilot employees, what challenges they're facing. Uh, when we first started doing that, we weren't quite sure of the, the value in them uh, for a couple of reasons. One, as pilots, we weren't really very uh, experienced at discussing with other pilots one-on-one. -on -one. We we're much more comfortable observing. So for us, we felt that the flight observations were probably the more important aspect. But over time, we've discovered that uh, the shop talks provide incredible val uh, value, very rich, detailed information that we would not get uh, on a flight simply because we have time to sit there and talk with pilots one-on-one -on -one and ask them several follow-up questions to really understand the challenges that they face. Uh, we finished 2019 with approximately 100 flight observations and 10 shop talks, so a pretty decent data set. Uh, and throughout that period, we were kind of fine-tuning our language recognizing what was working, what wasn't working. Uh, and so when we first started with the initial flights, uh, our data probably was not very uh, where we wanted it to be. But as time has gone on and towards the later end of 2019, we felt really happy with the data that we were collecting. We could see how much 
uh, and it improved and how much more robust it was. <laughs> Subsequently, at the end of 2019, we wrote a white paper discussing our journey up till that point, uh, which did not discuss any of the data collection and data analysis rather. Uh, we're saving that for white paper two uh, because um, due to COVID in 2020, we have not been out observing crews. It's affected not only the world, but it's affected our operation as well. So we chose to use 2020 since we could not be out uh, actually gathering data solidifying our process uh, so that when we do go back out in 2021, we have a very solid, uh, robust uh, approach that we're comfortable with so that we know the return will, uh, will hopefully get us more, uh, more valuable data. And uh, finally, uh, we just sent out this week uh, our first uh, template for our Shop Talk uh, chats for the first quarter of 2021. We trained three new observers that are going to uh, help us uh, improve the, the data capture. So we're really excited about that. Um, and like I said, over time, we, we felt that, that the shop talk aspect is gonna become very valuable. Thanks, um, thanks guys. Great, great intro. What I took out of that is um, is a couple of things that you guys said. You, you identified some of the pilots and crew that were known to be high performance. So I assume when we, there's a lot on the line who are familiar with safety too. And we talk a lot about learning from success or um, learning from what goes well. And that's sort of a departure in a lot of ways from some of the historical ways of finding the problems and then, you know, trying to fix the problem. So that random nature of your observations and then also learning from um, high performance is, is will provide you with a lot of insights. The, um, the shop talk, um, there's a question from Josh Bryan online about how you capture that shop talk information, like that one-on-one -on -one conversation. How do you capture and use that information and bring those sort of 10 conversations together? Sure, uh, well, typically uh, we conduct them in our training centers where pilots come for recurrent training or initial training. Uh, when they're on a break, they have some spare time. We approach them and we ask if they have about 30 to 45 minutes to just talk with us uh, about some safety related items, uh, more of a discussion. Uh, we're not, uh, it's non jeopardy, it's de identified. Nobody's going to know who they are. Um, but it allows us to really uh, get down deep into some, some uh, you know, problems that, uh, that we face in our everyday work. Uh, and they're, you know, either recorded at the you know consent of the uh, participant and if they don't feel comfortable there's just handwritten notes that we have and the, the, the whole purpose of them really is two pilots sitting around talking trading stories and what we're discovering uh you know our our program is called the learning improvement team or lit the learn is really what we think is the most valuable uh part of what we're doing and so we're trying to find a way to promote sharing of knowledge and experiences uh among other pilots aviation fortunately is very safe uh and and so a lot of stuff that happens we don't hear about because at the end it was a successful outcome but as line pilots we know that sometimes there are odd situations or things that happen that you're not going to hear about that you kind of want to. So that's the purpose, uh, one of the purposes of the shop talk. And I think that um, that's a great story. And I like the way you said, you know, two pilots sitting around talking and, and you know, we know how, how much we can uncover if we get that comfortable environment, uh, that comfortable environment going and particularly peers or, or people who understand the work context really well. There's a, there's a question about, um, things that surprised you with these shop talks and maybe if I go broadly is what's something that you've learned with these observations and shop talks that you've learned through this sort of data collection that this new sort of stream of data into your into your business that you wouldn't have known otherwise about sort of safety and flight operations yeah David that's a great question and probably the number one um, takeaway just in our first again really a proof of concept effort we've done to date um, but going through that data, we got some insight into the relationships and roles within our cockpits that we didn't know about before. Um, and it, it has to do with, uh, we call the two pilots, generally in modern aviation, we call the two pilots in the front of the cockpit, the pilot flying is the, the, the pilot that's responsible for manipulating the airplane and flying the airplane. Uh, and the other pilot is, is termed the pilot monitoring. 
Um, pilot monitoring has just as important roles in many phases of flight as the pilot flying, um, but we uncovered some areas where the pilot monitoring, um, the, 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 the resiliency, the pilot monitoring was adding to the, to the system, to the, to the equation, wasn't what we wanted, wasn't necessarily always good. Um, so we're looking at it from a safety two, trying to look at it from the positive side, but it still showed us some, some maybe holes and some gaps. So um, we're taking that back into our training department. Um, we're, we're highlighting those areas and we're talking about learning what our best pilot monitors do, what our most resilient pilot monitors do, and then trying to figure out how to get that back into training and share that with the live pilots and say, this is, this is really uh, the pilot monitors that are, that are doing it according to our policies and procedures and, and having the effect we would like. And, and we're finding that maybe the policies and procedures are not written that well. So it's leading the pilots down that path. Again, it's not, not individual problems, it's probably the policies and procedures. So it's causing us to go all the way back and look at that. Yeah, I think that's a great example um, of something that you learn when you, when you have a blank piece of paper doing these observations and these shop talk conversations and, and letting, it, letting, letting you kind of see things that you might not see with your checklists and, and your other processes. And one of the common misunderstandings of work as imagined and work as done is, is the belief sometimes that work as done is right. And, we, and that's probably the hardest thing about safety too is that um, whenever there's a gap between what you think you want and what you're getting, you've got to make a decision about whether what you're getting is, is safe and okay and should be supported by the organization or you actually, or it's drift and you actually, you actually want to create some correction in the way that work, um, work is done. So there's a question from Mark Peters about the difference between LOSA and the approach that you're taking. And I might expand that question as well a little bit broadly because, you know, aviation is a very heavily regulated industry. You guys work and operate um, to, to your SMS. And so, how have you how have you kind of integrated or complemented um, LOSA with some of these other observations and shop talks? How does this? What's the difference in these processes, and how do these processes come together um, for you guys? Um, yeah, great question. Thanks, Mark. Um, this was one of our initial true struggles. We we in the very very beginning, we tried to keep LOSA and let we thought we could maybe work them together. Um, and, and intertwine them from day one and, and, and make it work. We have, we have a pretty robust LOSA program in American Airlines we have for years. Um, to answer the, the basis of the question, and then I'll, I'll get into David's expansion, uh, LOSA collects data using the threat and air management framework, the threat and air management taxonomy in the cockpit, which is pretty safety one. Quite honestly, you're looking at threats and you're looking at errors that the crews do. Now we do see good, we see resilient behavior uh, in, the, in the cockpit frequently in LOSA, but the observers are trained and we look for things like errors and undesired states, kind of negative safety one type terms. Um, so we decided uh, very shortly after we tried to keep the two programs together that, that it, it was a challenge. It was a challenge for the individual, the observers, to be able to jump back and forth between looking just for resilience versus looking for errors uh, and errors that crews were making. Um, so we decided to separate the two programs, which was actually, I think still to this day, we're pretty, we're, we're, we're pretty happy with that decision and keep them completely separate. Um, they don't intermix. Now we are starting to see where some of the data crosses over between LOSA and, and LIT just, just recently in the last two months. And, and that's very fascinating to us. And, um, we, we've captured some data that, that is showing very similar things, which always makes us happy that we can validate one, one program's data from the other. Um, how do we bring it into our SMS uh, is, again, we have a very pretty robust SMS process in all the, all the modern airlines of the world, and especially in American Airlines. Um, we, it's a data stream. Quite simply, it's a data stream for us. Uh, when we identify an issue, or maybe even LIT could identify an issue, um, the lit process could identify an issue. We would go back and pull the data and analyze the data and bring that data to the decision makers and, and present the data and say, here's what the data says along the lines of this issue. And then they're the ones that are gonna make the decision. And we're gonna say, this is what the crews are actually doing in this situation. Um, and then, you know, this is what the book says. It may be exactly what you said, David. It may be what the book says, it may not. Um, or, are we happy with that? And what do we want to do about it? And then generally recommendations will flow from the decision makers out of that. But it's just become a very robust, a different data stream that looks at things with a little different approach. 
uh, and a very refreshing approach in, in many ways. And I think that's always been, James, I think um, Eric Holnagel would say that, you know, that safety one and safety two in many ways should be complementary because they provide different data streams about the same system. And um, there's another question in there from Hector that talks about developing safety two in parallel with safety one. And I know, I don't know if any of the Cathay Pacific guys are on the call, but I know with their operating lear operational learning reviews, which they do sort of post event, they run their, their, their incident investigation in accordance with their SMS, but they also do this OLR um, learning review in so somewhat in parallel um, to get multiple data streams um, and, and, and bring those, those data streams back together. So maybe that is a lesson for people that, you know, to get started or to make some momentum in safety too, trying too early to bridge the worlds together um, may actually kind of slow you down a little bit as opposed to doing something in parallel. But there's a question here that I think provides an opportunity for you to talk about some of the people that you're working with, James. There's a question about, has American Airlines shared the insights or value you're gaining this approach with your competitors? So I guess other airlines, and we talk sometimes like there's, you know, there's no um, seat or no, you know, we don't compete on safety. But do you want to talk about some of the partners that you're working with and, and, and I suppose how you are um, sort of trying to share what you're doing with, with other airlines? Yeah, thanks. And, and a great question. Um, American Airlines from day one has been very, we've been trying to be as transparent in this process as we could. That's why we took the time to write the white paper. It's available for anyone and everyone um, to read it. Um, uh, please, if you need it, David posted it, I think, with the registration or, or you're welcome to reach out to us back in America. We'll be happy to get you a copy. Um, we wrote that white paper because we just wanted to document what we did in support of anyone else that wants to go down this path, hopefully to not have to make the same mistakes we did, because we've made plenty. Um, we're not academics um, and we're not researchers. Almost everyone working on this project is a pilot. Um, and uh, that provides that provides us some, some limitations and some opportunities. We understand the domain, we're domain experts, but we're not always the best with the process and, and, and academic type thinking. So we get stuck in, in our out of the box thinking being, you know, the airline doesn't necessarily hire us to be out of the box thinkers. So when we ask pilots, when I brought Nick in and, and put him in charge of the team and asked him to, to think outside the box, he just he just looked at me like I don't I don't that's not what I get paid for. It's not our normal role. But but we've partnered with so many folks that have that have been so helpful, including you, Dave. We've said that um, Forgeworks folks have been outstanding. Um, we one of our first, obviously Eric. I, I started with that. Eric's been a very gracious host. Um, been very um, kind and supportive, probably one of our biggest supporters. Uh, we stay in touch with him regularly. He's always interested to know what we're, what we're doing and what we're learning, um, even though we've altered his language some um, because he told us to write our own. And I told him well, if we write our own, it's probably not gonna be what you would write. And he, he supported that. So that was very nice. Um, we've, uh, the, the Cognitive Systems Engineering Lab at the Ohio State University has been very supportive of us really from day one, David Woods and Mike Breo. Um, we actually had an intern from their lab, a doctoral um, a student, uh, Christine Jeffries was, a, was an amazing help for us in our first year because she brought a little bit of academic rigor and standard to the project and the process and made sure we were, we were on path at different times. We're working with our, um, in the United States, our, Na our NASA, our NASA is our um, National Aeronautics Space Administration, but they also support commercial aviation in a lot of different ways and their human factors lab um, is working with us and uh, helping us both analyze data, um, understand the data we're looking at and asking some very good questions because they look at difficult data like this routinely, um, helping us learn how to analyze the data. Uh, and they've been excellent partners with us from again from day one and, and they want to keep going forward and, and help us learn from our data. Uh, and then the peer airlines is such a good question, Dave. And, and I want to just take a minute on that one because in, the, in our LOSA world, we, we share our LOSA data with other peer airlines um, fairly regularly. Um, we'll get together for a day or two and we'll go through our data and talk about issues we're seeing and out of things that don't make sense to us and ask them if they're seeing the same issues. Uh, we learned so much from that process. And we can do that because we're fairly standardized and, and, and we all are talking in the same language and we understand each other, we understand the process. And I know that when they call something a threat, that it's, it's a threat the way I understand threat. So one of our goals from very early on at American was to try to get the rest of our industry to have that similar, similar language, that similar lexicon, such that we can talk in the future as other airlines go down this path. 
Um, we think that's very important. So we've worked with Cathay from almost very early in the process, Cathay Pacific Scott, taking some very big steps down the road. Um, they've been excellent partners with us, um, sharing their information. We've talked with Singapore Airlines, uh, is also doing a, an effort with Safety2, and, and they've been outstanding uh, friends of ours and helps. And then um, some of our peer airlines in the United States are looking at getting into the programs right now, and they're coming to us and asking them to help us, which we're always help, always always more than willing to do. So any of our peer airlines out there, we're, we're more than willing to help out. Give us a call, and we can uh, we recommend you read the, the, at least the first white paper first. And we'd be happy to do a call with you and talk to you about how to get started or how we got started. Uh, and then um, follow up with, uh, if, once you start getting some data, if you do, we'd be happy to talk about it. Yeah, great, um, great points, James. I think that the message there for people getting started is to, um, is to surround yourself with, with people who can support you at, um, from both within your industry, but also the academic world and, and other people. So shout out to the OSU um, Cognitive Systems Engineering Lab, and as well as John Holbrook and the team from NASA. Um, commercial Aviation Safety Department and, and others. Um, there's a question here from Yvonne Herrera, who's um, the president of the Resilience Engineering Association. I think it's midnight in Norway. And in some of the discussions they've been having with pilots, um, I suppose in, in Europe, they're identifying lots around trade-offs. And we know that goal conflict and trade-offs um, you know, present real challenges for, for frontline folk around maintaining operational, meeting operational performance targets as well as maintaining safety. Is there any insights that you've got out of your shop talk and out of um, your, your flight observations around how, how the, you know, cockpits deal with trade-offs that you know, might be new or novel um, that, that you've learned? Uh, yeah, absolutely, that's a great question. Um, you know, one of the things that we've picked up on is uh, that crews that, that that talk to each other, but not, uh, you know, superfluous conversation, but they, they discuss with each other where they're at mentally and, and talk about things as they come, are very effective in, in, in meeting a lot of challenges. And what's interesting to us is that a lot of what they do is quite simple. They don't say much, but it's enough to cue in the other pilot that I'm aware of what's going on. And, you know, we, we haven't at least in my career, that hasn't really been completely fostered. I mean, we, we've, we've trained pilots to speak up when we're uh, in, a, in an undesirable situation, but uh, we've seen a lot where uh, it might just be, you know, a day where the crew is dealing with a lot of thunderstorms or weather and, and they're well within the guidelines, but just a simple exchange uh, between the two or three pilots really goes a long way to improving the resilience of the crew. Yeah. Um, there's a question, another another sort of extension question, um, slightly different topic from Justin Ryder. So handles at um, the Royal Australian Air Force, who's asking, have you guys got a plan or done any work to roll out any of this your lit program? So your observations and your shop talk to other areas of the AA workforce, like cabin crew or um, or maintenance or ground staff. Uh, excellent question. Yeah, we've been a, we've been uh, approached by multiple other departments within American to help them. Um, we've been a little hesitant, just making sure that we were confident in, in, in what we were doing and that we've gotten to a place that we're willing to go and share. We are now just in the last probably three months. Um, we're confident the process is moving forward. We've done a pretty thorough review in the last four or five months with our senior leadership and showed them what we've done and the data we've collected uh, and asking for the go ahead. I mean, because this is certainly a voluntary program. There's no, um, our regulator would tell you, um, you know, there's no requirement to do any of this. So it's all voluntary. Um, they support us in doing it because they love us bringing in a new data stream uh, anytime into our SMS. So they're very supportive, but it's not required. Um, but, you know, it really goes down to that very first question of, of are they ready for it? You know, David, and, and you know what I'm talking about with the, 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 the organization has to be ready for it. Uh, there has to be the senior leadership buy-in that and, and the support. And um, I don't know if we want to call it the psychological safety to be able to speak up and, and, and speak freely when it's time to, um, you know, I'm not sure we'll get that everywhere. It may take a little while. This could be the impetus to get there. Um, but, but that's probably one of my biggest concerns and some of the other. I know our dispatch function uh, or our, our integrated operations center, which en encompasses dispatch and weather and scheduling functions, they're very interested. We've actually presented with them and showed them some of our work. And, 
and they are going to start trying to collect some of their data and their, and their regime. Yeah, I think James, that's a really good point. The way that you say it's not mandatory to do uh, many of these safety to in practice approaches as we're putting into our organization to understand how, to, how, how work happens and how to support it better, um, make it go well more of the time is discretionary effort. It's not required by an SMS or, or regulation. Um, so it means when you're approaching management teams in maintenance or in, in, in cabin crew or, or other parts of your business, then you're asking them to do something that they wouldn't normally otherwise have to do. So they ha there has to be a certain level of, of um, I mean, you use the word maturity, but a, a level of understanding and willingness and desire um, to support that, that discretionary effort to take people offline, to let people into their business. Um, and, and so I suppose that's an individual question for everyone, for their own organizations about where, what parts of their organizations are ready to, to support something like this. And when we think about supporting it, um, I know your role, I suppose, um, Quaz in, in um, sort of on the union side a little bit, there's a couple of questions here that I'm going to bring together. So there's one about getting, did you get any resistance from pilots you spoke with from Avril Beecham? And then Josh Bryant's asked, you know, in the view of, because of the view of a unionized workforce, was the workforce sort of welcoming of the process or was there a real hesitation um, wanting to know what the intent was and was it slow going at the start to get um, the guys? How, how did you approach that kind of um, engagement with the front line around the process? Um, yeah, thank you. That's a great question. And uh, we have built a really good reputation with the pilot group with our LOSA program. Uh, LOS observers are ambassadors to the program, and so in their everyday approach to that job, they're very good at showing that, that what they're collecting for the company is valuable to the pilots, and there's no threat uh, to the pilot to allow the observer to ride. And that's taken years to, to foster and to build, and we operate under those same principles. And so when I've gone out to observe crews with LIT, they've been extremely open, very interested in what we're doing, very engaged and very excited. Uh, if, if we have a longer flight where we've got time to talk about what we're working on, they get really excited about it uh, because it's, you know, the stuff that we ask, certainly in my career, you don't too often get asked, well, what do you think about this? Um, so, you know, we, I have personally, nor have anybody that I'm aware of had any resistance at all from the line pilot to what we're doing uh, simply because we try as hard as we can to, to be good ambassadors and to relay that we're not out here to get stuff to get you in trouble. We're out here to learn from what you're facing, what your challenges are, and, and spread that among all of us to make us better as a group. Yeah, good response. Nick, and I think just to take that um, a little bit further is that um, there's a question here from Andrew Mizzy about are there things that you're doing to um, feed back the learnings, the broader learnings back to the crews, like aside from maybe changing some of the policies and procedures, some of the training, but is there is there a, a flow of information going back out to, to the pilot group from, from the data stream coming in? Yeah, we, we published several articles uh, in our internal publication. Uh, one of the big areas of our uh, uh, data capture is being used in a captain's leadership development course that the airline is developing or has developed that will be implemented shortly, uh, where all captains, not just new captains, but all captains uh, will attend this course. And in these uh, these shop talks, uh, we ask several pointed questions about leadership. Uh, for example, um, as a first officer, when I show up to work and I walk on the flight deck, within literally five minutes, I pretty much know how that trip's gonna go, my first interaction. Uh, with the captain. So we wanted to know what is it, what are certain things that captains do or don't do that that alerts you, hey, this guy or, 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 or woman is going to listen to me and, and take my input or they're not. Uh, we asked, we have a lot of really experienced captains that have been in the seat 30 years as a captain, not just working for the airline. Um, knowing what you know now as a captain what, what would you tell yourself the day you checked out as a brand new captain that you think is really important? What stuff did you worry about that you didn't really need to? And what should you watch out for that you didn't think was gonna be a, that big of a deal? Uh, and, and the stories that you get and the, the what you hear these pilots say is absolutely amazing. And we feed that back to our pilots. Um, obviously you can't train personality, that's very difficult, uh, but you can give people some tools to say, 
doing these very basic things are it was going to open the floodgates and allow this crew to perform so much higher uh, than if, if you don't do them. Yeah, and Dave, I'll, I'll announce that we're going to we're going to start some kind of a new social media stream to our pilots, knowing that that's a little better uh, means of discussing with them than even putting it in a uh, online iPad, you know, flight safety magazine. So we're going to be we're going to be doing podcasts or. Um, discussions with them, webinars where we record them and, and they can click on them and watch a, a three to five minute video or discussion from folks like Nick that do this every day out there, talk with our crews and explain them what they've learned and seen uh, and, and we're excited about that. So yeah. he, he may not be excited. And now that we're going to be podcast, podcast, uh, you know, experienced uh, experts, we'll, we'll be ready to go out and do it on our own. Yeah, look, I think that's great. And, and um, Nick, I think that's a great question. You ask a 30 year experienced, um, you know, um, frontline worker and leader in any industry, what would you tell yourself or what would you tell a new person coming into the position? There's a huge amount of advice there. So um, Paul Daly's asked a question. I'm going to throw that question back on both of you guys now about the question is looking back and reflecting now, if you think back over the last two years, what are some of your biggest kind of learnings from when you started out on this path? And in his words, Paul's words, not mine, if you could go back and talk to yourself then in 2018, what would you, what would you say or, or what would your advice be? <laughs> Go ahead, Nick. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, first, uh, you know, personally, what have I learned? I've learned how I approach my work when I go just to just to go fly. Uh, one of the real benefits about being a, a loss observer, now lit observer, is I, I love pilots. I love being around pilots, talking with pilots, and and and. The things that I've picked up that I can fold into my work going forward that don't cost anything uh, has been really valuable to me. Uh, so I've learned a lot from that regard. Uh, uh, you know, and I think, you know, for us, uh, particularly with, with the LOSA background, which is deeply rooted in safety one, um, when we started this, this work uh, and we said, hey, we're going to go out and, and look at all the things that go right. As a pilot, you're sort of hardwired to say, well, that's just our job. That's what we're supposed to do so that we don't really talk about that. But all of us that do the job know that uh, there are, are some crews that are higher functioning than others. So what, what, are, what are the ingredients in that suit that we can pull out and, and try and spread out? And, and that was difficult for me personally and the other team members switching from that safety one to looking for the resilient uh, performance, it was uncomfortable for us a little bit because we're just not used to uh, thinking that way. Now, if I was trying to go out and do a loss observation, it would be terrible because I'm, I'm, I'm looking at things from the resilient standpoint and not from, from the other standpoint. So uh, my advice would be to, uh, to try things. We were not afraid to try and, and there have been a couple of times where we've stumbled a little bit and recognized this is not the direction that we wanna go but we've also opened up a lot of new avenues that we never in a million years would have thought it would have taken us. So don't be afraid to just try things and recognize that uh, there is no one size fits all for safety too. It, 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 what is working for us at American Airlines may not work for other organizations, uh, but that I would, I would say is one of my biggest takeaways. Yeah, David, and, and I'll throw it just briefly. The couple of times we got stuck and frustrated and probably off track a little bit was in our two and a half, three year journey now is, is when we would, you know, we'd, we'd maybe, we'd, we'd hunker down into our little world and we'd just say, well, we can just figure this out. We can just, we just got to push harder and, and, and think harder about it. Um, and like I, I, I hinted at earlier, pilots aren't the best out of the box thinkers. So sometimes we get stuck quite honestly and, and very railroaded down one thought path, which maybe wasn't the right one. Um, so talk, just talk with other people. There's so many people out there in this industry that are more than willing to, to spend their time and energy with you and, and share with you and just, they'll ask you some questions that make you go, I don't know, never even thought of that, but you know what? We need to probably know that answer. So I'm going to take you back to my team and we're going to come up with that answer. And in, in deriving that answer, you're going to learn so much. So, so kudos to everyone that's helped us along the way. It really helped us get where we are today, um, and, and we're, like I said, and, and why we're willing to do this podcast and write the paper and all the presentations we've been trying to do recently is just to get the word out and tell people we, we will have that conversation with you if you would like. We're not going to push what we're doing on you, but but we're happy to share our, our experience, and if we can save you some of the 
um, discussions, the heated discussions we had or, or the, the different uh, headbutting we did along the way, we'd be happy to do that and, and, and share with you, hey, talk to this person. I think if you talk to this person, they will help you through this scenario. They're, they're, they're experts in this exact type of, of situation. And, and they're just gonna, they're gonna open your mind up. And, and we really, we did that. So, so we wanted to, I, I, that'd be the thing I learned is to, is to use that. And maybe when you're getting stuck, take a step back and, and try to do it yourself. But if you can't, don't be afraid to pick up the phone and get on the, get on, um, you know, set up phone calls with these really smart people that have been doing it and, and they'll be happy to talk you through. Thanks, uh, Nick. Thanks, James. Um, so you mentioned there about getting on the phone and 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 reaching out and um and building community around around yourself in in um you know in any change or or any any innovation or anything new. It's it, I I think it helps. And there's a question here from Don Halpin about um have you seen other industries uh, moving towards safety too? And and you know healthcare is mentioned and a few of these other industries. And I know you were planning a, a safety two day in March and I was all booked to go, but COVID stopped that as happening. But you had a number of different industries that were sort of lined up to participate in that. So do you want to talk about, you know, maybe the broader outside of aviation industry kind of network that you're sort of seeing and engaging with? Because um, I think you're doing quite a bit of that, aren't you? We are, Dave. Yeah, we, um, some of the first uh, uh, outstanding uh, uh, collaborators we found were in medicine. Um, there's a, quite a few uh, uh, health hospital systems that are pretty far out in front with this. Um, they're taking a slightly different approach uh, than we are at American, but, but their, their knowledge level and the experience they had, they were ahead of us, well ahead of us, even when we started two, two and a half years ago talking to them, really helped us and, and helps having some great conversations. There's one right there in Columbus, Ohio, um, the Nationwide Children's Hospital there is doing outstanding work. Um, they're probably as far ahead as anyone I've seen yet in the medical field. We've spoken, uh, we've been asked to present at, at a few medical conferences, which is a little interesting for us as pilots. We always feel completely out of our element, but we come and we just talk about what we've done and, and they're usually fascinated and they love asking questions about how it applies in our world. Uh, and we do the same thing. So that's been very helpful for us. Um, we've learned a lot from the mining and the oil and gas industry. I have talking to other to other individuals that are that are been dealing with this for quite a while and learned a lot. So um, those are probably our biggest um, our biggest direct connects. Um, very ripe for medicine, obviously. Um, but it goes back to the question that was asked about your Dave, You kind of put it right when you said, "Are you ready?" Is the maturity level there? And, and medicine's mature. But it's matured in a different way, and, and and you probably just need to ask that question that and, and and to get the to get the idea as if that that organization's ready, is just get into the work is done versus work is imagined um, um, discussion, and if leadership gets uncomfortable, and if leadership doesn't want to hear, and if leadership doesn't isn't interested to know the difference and the, the delta between work is done and work is imagined, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be tough. But if they really know, if they know there's a difference and they're willing to learn about it, even knowing that it may hurt a little because it might be the procedures they wrote that aren't getting followed um, for different reasons. Uh, maybe their procedures weren't as perfect as they had hoped when they wrote them. Um, then, you got, then, you're in a, then you're in a position to probably make some change and, and make some impact. So yeah, great. I think that question of executive support um, is sort of important. It, it sounds like it got you guys started. Um, and then it's really up to up to you to make it happen, um, and and I suppose the line management of the business to make it happen. But there's a couple of questions here about, um, like I suppose it, some some organisations um, maybe don't want to open up that conversation about workers. Imagine work as done. I mean, it just wants to keep putting that that um, that focus on on compliance and and management kind of maybe don't want to hear um, a lot of the realities of the problems in their business. And that's an unfair judgment, but I'm sure. Um, you know, we all we've all seen or been part of organisations a little bit like that. But is, so, has there any been any question from Stephen Harvey? Has there been any feedback from the pilots through this sort of new data stream you're talking about, new insights that has made yourselves or or the organisation a little bit uncomfortable? Or um, and and how does that how does it, how do the execs kind of see what's going on and and how do you keep them comfortable that learning all of this stuff and 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 knowing about all this dirty laundry and what, how the messiness of work um, is a good thing. Uh, to be honest, we know they're on the call. 
Paul Dave. That's yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. they're right. probably listening. <laughs> so yes. Go ahead. That's a good. That's a good. That's a good answer in itself. You know, like. You know, your execs don't yeah. have to know everything yeah. that's going on. You know, things need to be dealt with at the level of the organization where they should be dealt with. So um, I think, yeah, providing providing um, information out of context to people who don't have the context um, can just cause you more problems, maybe. Yeah, they, I would say, in my experience, going to the meetings, bringing the data stream to them on a regular basis, um, they want it. I mean, it can hurt. I mean, you can see them. I mean, it physically pains them at times to hear that, you know, things aren't going maybe as, 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 as in line with the book as they had hoped. But uh, they've been, they've been, they'll hear the story. They'll hear it. Um, and, and usually what we try to encourage is we need to figure out why, you know, why the why, the why is it not? Why are we not following the procedure? Let's figure that out. And then we can come up with some recommendations, whether it's going to be to look at the procedure um, uh, or, you know, what, what is the issue? You know, how, what, what's the goal of the procedure, the policy, the procedure, and then, you know, can we get to it a different path or, or all that? So um, it's, Americans been very open, I would say probably more open than even I um, would have expected when we started this. Yeah, right. and I just add that from, from our approach to work, uh, in the last nine months of COVID has changed tremendously. Uh, the, the, just the challenges day to day that the pilots are facing. And so something as simple as uh, we have what are called flows, uh, which is just a predetermined order of events that are gonna occur prior to each flight. And and on a lot of the fleets, you know, you're not gonna be in preparing the airplane for departure until 10 minutes prior to pushing off the gate. But back early on when there was no passengers, you know, the, the flight's ready to go 30 minutes early. So the crew all of a sudden is time compressed uh, to get everything done and there's this pressure. So they recognize that things have changed and the airlines have actually been very, uh, very open and interested to figure out what's really going on out at the pointy end uh, because it's changed significantly and our, our crews are, are coping with it quite effectively. But, uh, you know, the, our purposes are to find out more about what, what they're really seeing, what they're really dealing with. Yeah. I think that's... Um that that climate in the bit if you can get the your business to be curious if you can get all of your leaders to be curious about how work happens like you say really want to engage in that discussion about work as imagine work has done i think that's one of the big momentum creators for safety too um having managers that are really curious about how the front line actually actually works and so in doing that I've, there's a couple of tactical questions i think might help um to people who um i think in a lot of the safety too in practice conversations we try to get really actionable for for people so did, have you guys a question um, here from Mal Gallagher? Have you like LOSA has, like you said, a fairly a fairly um, clear and consistent taxonomy around threat and error um, types of threat and errors and how to record the information. Have you created any frameworks or taxonomy um, for your work observations or your resilience observations? Have you sort of pointed out to the observers the things that are most useful, or are they still sit, or, or are they sitting in the jump sheet with a with a blank piece of paper? Um, observing work, like, do you get do people record data in a format, or um, just let them feed it back however they they see it? So we have created a taxonomy. We followed Eric's instruction. It took us years, and a lot of blood and sweat, probably. Um, but we uh, we've created a model. Uh, we'll put it up on the screen for those of you that can see it right now. It's our our model we'll follows some. Um, four potentials around the outside, similar to Eric's, but changed a little bit for our domain. This is our lit model. We have learn, plan, adapt, and coordinate. We're trying to build resilience. That's what we're trying to build is our crews to be, to have is, have more and more resilience every day to handle the operation. So this is our model. We started with this, uh, with the potentials, and then we came up underneath the potential, something to measure is the proficiencies. And uh, we have, we came up, we've, we've settled on in the last six months, about 27 unique proficiencies that we can actually record in the flight deck. You'll see them right here uh, under the four different potentials. Learn, learn's always at the top center of our model because we think it's most important, but then plan. And then we have them for adapt and coordinate also. Uh, you can see them here. Uh, we're welcome to share these. These will be in the second white paper. They were not ready for release when we wrote the first white paper. We were still quite honestly modifying them and, and going through an iterative process of, of deciding exactly what 
uh, what proficiencies we wanted to keep and not keep. I can tell you that through over a, a, almost 100 observations we've done in the flight deck uh, based on lit, based on safety two, uh, almost everything we've seen can be coded within these proficiencies. Uh, and at first people, I, we looked at them and they're very aviation centric, but then we've had other, other um, domains look at them and go, you know, it would not be that hard to apply these right to our world, obviously. Um, depends if you work in a team environment or not, like we do as a team of at least two in the, in the flight deck. But if not, um, or you, it might be take a little bit of modifying if you wanted to bring it into your domain, but I don't think it would be that difficult to do. So these are available. We'll be happy to share these. These are, these are out there. I've done this presentation a few times in the last uh, three to four months where we've released this. And I want to just follow up with that, David, that um, we're working also with the Flight Safety Foundation. The Flight Safety Foundation, for those of you that don't know, is a, a nonprofit organization based in the United States for all airlines worldwide is a basically a safety think tank and, and trying to be a, 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 a central focal point to drive some safety improvements in the entire industry. Flight Safety Foundation does great work on, on some different avenues. And uh, we've partnered with them. They're our final partner. I didn't get them in my earlier partner discussion. I saved it. Um, but they're probably our biggest partner right now because and collaborator because um, we've been working with them for a while and, and shared with them where we've been and what we've done. And, and they, they see great, great uh, promise in it. And right now we're writing a paper. Uh, I'm not writing the, the first draft of the paper is being written by Eric, by Dr. Cole Nagel. Uh, up in Copenhagen as we speak. I talked with him earlier this week and he said they're, they're actively writing it. Um, the paper will be written by the, 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 the big thinkers, we like to call them, that, that think about this all day. It's gonna be domain specific for the, for the airline world. Uh, and then we're gonna get together with industry early in 2021 and we're gonna review that paper. And we're gonna provide some of our experience, Cathay will, Singapore will, uh, airlines that are doing safety too are gonna provide their experience to date um, lessons learned, failures, so that we can feed that into the paper and have that available for everyone, uh, including this language. And, and in American, we want to share the language again because I want in the future, I, I have a vision where we can get together and talk safety too in the same, same taxonomy. Um, that would be so valuable for all of us. Uh, and it would give us the opportunity to, to keep all of our efforts and our focus and our resources all all pointed in, in within a hopefully within one one smaller field of play, such that we can get some real wins and some real uh, we can get some real we can learn a lot more about each other and in our operations uh, by doing that by not having to go back and figure out how our tax taxonomies are different. So. Yeah, yeah, and I think that paper that like you said that um, paper that um, Professor Eric Holnag was writing. I think Adam John's former um, Cathay safety team, um, Steve Sharrock from Eurocontrol, and there's some. There's some, you know, the author group is is people in industry who are who are working and done this and and connecting with yourselves um, at American and others in in early 21 is going to produce I think a really really useful um, resource and I love the way um, Quaz that you're always talking about. Look, let's 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 make it so that we can talk to each other by having having language and understanding um, and community so that we can all um, share and learn. Is there anything else? Guys, that you want you want to share any 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 other advice, any other thoughts? What what you guys are doing? What else is happening next at um, at American? What's uh, or where do you see yourselves? Where do you see the airline five years from now with its safety safety approach? What what would you leave everyone with? Uh, well, in the short term, uh, our plan uh, as soon as things ramp back up in the first part of two thousand twenty one is to continue with the data collection, both in the shop talk uh, and the uh, flight observation. Uh, like I said, this week we rolled out our first quarter shop talk questions uh, for 2021. And that's exciting for us because part of that is uh, we went to our, our, our lead check airmen from all the different fleets to ask them what they would like to know. Uh, and we're going to ask those questions to their pilots and, and, and find uh, hopefully some interesting and exciting things. So we're, we're looking forward to those. Uh, and we're also looking forward to uh, the flight observations now that our uh, language is essentially finalized and our, our process is solidified uh, to go out and get some more data uh, for analysis. Uh, long term, we would like to see this become the, the fourth leg of the safety table, if you will, as another data stream in SMS, um, because what has been really interesting to me in this whole process uh, is that 
during part of our development or during our development, we've been able to discuss with, with the other branches uh, and, and ask them, you know, to share their data. Uh, and, and it's a lot of it supporting what we're finding. So that's really exciting because you, you can kind of see that it all works together. Yeah, David, just, um, it, it's a, it's a, it's a tough, it's tough. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie to anybody who calls. We struggled. We worked hard and I got a lot of pretty smart people I brought in to help us and we still struggle. Um, it can be done. Hopefully it'll be easier for everybody that keeps coming behind. So, you know, we'll, we'll encourage you to have those discussions. You're going to have to have tough discussions. Though. I'm just telling you, that's, that's the nature of the beast. That's what this is. So you got to be willing and, and understand that it's not all neat and it's not just pulling out a form and, and filling in some, some, some data and, and then moving forward. Um, we, we struggle the time, but, but all those struggles helped and they helped develop that language and the language was developed over three, four, five iterations, at least of going back and looking at the data we actually collected to see did the language work, is the language sufficient and, and all that. So um, we're happy to share it. Like I told, like I said earlier, it's not our language. It's not, it doesn't have to be the language that the aviation industry uses this is the one we came up with, but we're happy to share what we did because um, uh, certainly, every airline can't can't probably probably wouldn't be willing to invest what it took to get through this. American made it made a very a very significant uh, investment in resources and, and pilots and in, and people and pulling us off of other places to do this. Uh, and it's been uh, I think they're happy with the investment. They really enjoy the data stream. I can tell you they enjoy reading what comes back. Um, it gives them an insight they probably didn't have before, which is which is what it's really about, you know, in, in, in aviation, standard SMS, we've gotten to a point in so safe that we're looking at, at so few incidents anymore in traditional safety one. We have so few real incidents anymore. Um, that's, we, we almost have to keep looking and digging and digging deeper and deeper. Uh, and, and instead of having to dig deeper in safety one, there's a whole lot of safety two. And I'll just throw it out there that our observers, just so you know, see well over 20 proficiencies on every flight even very standard, straightforward flights. And, and for us, just so everyone knows, a proficiency is doing something above and beyond our standard operating procedure. If they're just following procedures, that's not a proficiency. They have to be going significantly above and beyond uh, the way the book says you're supposed to do your job. Um, and they see well over 20 of these a flight. And when we tell our crews that at first, they might be like, just what Nick said, I'm just doing my job. And it is doing your job, but, but uh, we want to capture it and we want to see it and we want to see what it is that it, that it, that makes the job. What is it that makes the job up and makes the job description? And, and that's been very valuable and, and our leadership sees it. And, and that's been good to us. We've gotten to a point where we've, we're going to formalize this going forward into 2021 in America. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be a, a data stream for a while in our SMS process. Uh, I said our regulator supports us wholly uh, and they love seeing the data. Also, we share it with them on a real time basis. Um, so, so it's been exciting. It's been fun. Um, and, and I will tell you, it will, you will learn a lot about your operation if you're willing to go in and, and go down this path. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, um, James. Look, I like the way that's probably a nice way to start to start to wrap up, which is, um, those 20 proficiencies every flight. And we've been, I think, um, Eric and Dave Woods and, and Sydney Decker and right back Renee Amalberto with the paradox of totally safe transportation systems. Like when you don't have these things going wrong, you need insight. You need to get insight in other ways about your business, and and having that those twenty proficiencies every flight. You know, if you're just focusing on the procedures you've already got, and those twenty things aren't being done, then um, you know your system's not as safe as you as you might want it to be. And if you can get that knowledge, and if you can understand it, you can build it back into your your training and your simulation practices, and 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 strengthen, make your operations more more resilient by design. So, guys, I really appreciate the time you spent this afternoon. Um, I appreciate everyone who's joined joined our call. Um, hopefully, hopefully everyone got something out of it. This slightly different Q and A style of format, as opposed to a, a presentation style of format. I've certainly had a lot of fun. I've I've learned a lot from what, what you guys have done at American. Um, really looking forward to getting together when we when we can. It's been a tough year for everyone, but it's been no tougher for any industry than it has probably for the uh, for the aviation sector. So, um, I suppose congratulations on the continued investment in. Um, in trying to support your people better to do their work they do every day. 
Um, for those who want to reach out to Nick and Quaz, they're easy to get hold of. Um, if you if you need if you need a hand getting in touch with them, let let me know. We didn't get to all of the questions, so if you've got um, if we didn't answer one of your questions and it and it's burning, uh, shoot it through to 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 us at info at forgeworks.com. We'll um, if I think I can answer it, I'll I'll answer it. Otherwise, I'll get the answer out of out of the guys. And um, we're looking we're looking to sort of try to bring as many of these to. Um, to the community as we can uh, from from different organisations who are who are trying to do this work. So if there's organisations that you'd particularly like to to hear from, then um, also please let us know. So thanks again, Nick and James and American. Hope you have a good night. I know you've got a big team around you. It's not just the two of you at American. I think you're. Um, um, I think tonight you're uh, you're seeing Guy off from the team back into back into the line. So thanks, Guy, for um, for your efforts at American, and um, hope you guys have a good evening. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for all you, you do with your group and, and all the groups that you help. Uh, you just help learn. You know, you help us learn and get better by, by having great conversations and asking the tough questions. So we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, all. Have a great day or evening.